Today, we'll be talking about galactosemia, which is a family of disorders that are characterized by elevated levels of galactose in the blood. So galactose is a dietary sugar that's present in breast milk, among other substances, and its job is to be converted into glucose 1-phosphate, which can then enter glycolysis, and glycolysis helps generate ATP and energy for our bodies. So there are four enzymes that are involved in converting galactose into glucose 1-phosphate, and we'll meet those enzymes on the next slide. So here's a pathway looking at galactose metabolism. We start at the top here with breast milk, which is the most common dietary source of galactose in infants. And breast milk contains a lot of lactose. So lactose is a disaccharide, meaning it's composed of two sugars. So glucose, as shown here, and galactose. So the enzyme lactase, shown here, breaks apart those two sugars into one sugar units. And patients who lack lactase are lactose intolerant. And this is very common, particularly as one gets older. So the specific form of galactose that's formed after cleavage of lactose is called beta-D-galactose. So beta-D-galactose can then be converted to alpha-D-galactose via an enzyme called GAL-M, GAL-M. And if you're deficient in GAL-M, what you'll end up with is GAL-M deficiency. And this is the first form of galactosemia in this pathway that we'll encounter, the first of four. So next, the alpha-D galactose can be converted into galactose 1-phosphate via the enzyme galactokinase. So a kinase is a protein that adds a phosphate group onto another substance. And so galactokinase, a very uh, good name, it's adding a phosphate onto the galactose forming galactose 1-phosphate. And if you're deficient in galactokinase, you have galactokinase deficiency. And this is a condition that's characterized mainly by cataracts. We'll meet that on the next slide. So next, galactose 1P or galactose 1-phosphate is converted into glucose 1-phosphate. Remember, that's our, our goal is to make the glucose 1-phosphate. And the enzyme that does this is called GALT. So patients who are deficient in GALT have classic galactosemia. And this is the most common form of galactosemia, as well as the most severe form. But then there's one more form of galactosemia here called GALE deficiency. This is where you have an inability to, to convert UDP galactose into UDP glucose. Just remember here that galactokinase as well as GAL-M are also in general kinder. So in other words, more benign compared to the classic galactosemia, which can present with a variety of symptoms that we'll discuss here in just a minute. So here are the four subtypes of galactosemia displayed in a table format. So again, we have the same four enzymes that we met on the previous slide. The hallmark feature of all of these different subtypes is cataracts. So definitely good to remember that cataracts are very characteristic of galactosemia. In some cases, patients can actually be asymptomatic as with galactose mutarotase deficiency. In other cases, such as in GALT or GALE deficiency, you have more systemic symptoms. So such as failure to thrive, jaundice, hepatomegaly, as well as those cataracts that we mentioned already. Important to note that patients can also have intellectual disability as well as developmental delays. And then classically women will get early menopause. So menopause before the age of 40. Now laboratory wise, one important thing to distinguish and we can derive this via the pathway that we just saw is the presence or absence of elevated galactose 1-phosphate. So if we actually just go back to the previous slide for a second, galactose 1-phosphate is formed here. And so anything, any enzyme downstream of galactose 1-phosphate 
So that's GALT and GALE are going to have elevated levels of galactose 1-phosphate. Whereas lactokinase and GAL-M deficiency, because they're upstream of this galactose 1-phosphate, are not going to have elevated levels of GAL-1P. And that's essentially what we see here. The GAL-M and GAL-K have normal GAL-1P, and then the enzymes downstream, the GALT and GALE, have elevated GAL-1P. Just a few other points to know. All subtypes of galactosemia are inherited in a recessive manner. They all present with elevated galactose levels. We already covered that. And the treatment for all of these is dietary galactose restriction. So you want to remove galactose from the diet so it doesn't accumulate in the blood and in other organs. So I mentioned patients are at risk for cataracts. So the way I remember this is galasses for galactosemia. So galasses for galactosemia, that should help you remember that patients are at risk for cataracts. Patients who have any of these subtypes of galactosemia are at risk for cataracts. And then finally, the enzyme testing is available for most forms of galactosemia, particularly these three forms shown here, galactos uh, kinase, GALT, and GALE deficiencies. We'll spend some time talking about classic galactosemia, which is the most common and more, most severe form of galactosemia. So typically patients are asymptomatic at birth. As they start to breastfeed within a few days, they'll often develop vomiting, diarrhea, poor feeding, jaundice, weight loss, and lethargy. So they'll be really tired. They just won't be looking well. Um, patients can also present with a large liver and bruising. So the bruising is due to hepatic synthetic dysfunction. So the liver makes the clotting factors that are important for, uh, for bruising and for healing with bruising. So if you can't produce those clotting factors, you're gonna bruise easily. And those bruises are gonna take longer to heal. So cataracts, as we've already mentioned several times, are very common in all forms of galactosemia. Probably the most important thing from this slide to remember is that Infants with classic galactosemia are at risk for a life-threatening E. coli sepsis. So e. coli sepsis, very important to remember. And then again, the treatment is lifetime galactose restriction. One form of galactosemia that shows up is Duarte variant galactosemia. And particularly, this shows up on newborn screening. So it's more of a biochemical abnormality than a disease. So certainly more common than the classic galactosemia. And patients will have reduced GALT activity, so reduced um, to the level where it would be detected by newborn screen, but not so low as to cause any clinical symptoms. So these patients are asymptomatic from a clinical perspective. And there's no treatment or monitoring that's required after this is identified. So galactosemia is usually diagnosed on newborn screening. So if you have a positive result for galactosemia, it's very important to know you want to stop breastfeeding, ask the mom to stop breastfeeding or bottle feeding, and switch immediately to a soy-based formula. Okay, so you also want to check some labs. So typically liver function tests as well as liver synthetic function. So the PT and INR reflect the uh, coagulation abilities of the body. So good to check these uh, to make sure that the liver is okay. And then to confirm the diagnosis, you can test galactose 1-phosphate levels. We talked through that in the chart. Uh, enzyme assays, as well as molecular sequencing of these genes. So patients with classic galactosemia are at risk for several long-term complications. And those include intellectual disability, growth failure, and developmental delays. Primary ovarian insufficiency or early menopause typically occurs in most women with classic galactosemia. So that's menopause before the age of 40. And then you can monitor the dietary compliance of patients with classic galactosemia by measuring their GAL-1P levels in the blood. 
these are some of my references that I use. And I'd like to thank you for watching this video. If you found this video useful, please like, subscribe, and share. You can also subscribe to my weekly newsletter with board style questions for exams. And you can also buy me a copy to show your support for this channel. Thank you.